Buongiorno a tutti. Welcome back to Mission Italy's Transatlantic Thursday series. We are very excited to have all of you joining us from across Italy. I'm Karen Schinner, the Press and Cultural Council at the U.S. Consulate General in Naples. We are joined by colleagues throughout Italy from the U.S. Embassy in Rome and the U.S. Consulate Generals in Milan and Florence. And I would like to give a special thank you to the viewers joining us from the Prime Minister Group, in particular, Florinda Saeva, joining from Favara, Sicily, and Angela Lorenzana from Naples, as well as the University of Salento in Lecce, Professor Daniela De Luca and all of his students. And for those of you joining us for the first time, the Transatlantic Thursdays is an ongoing weekly series on a whole variety of topics with American and Italian speakers. To further explore, learn, and discuss the importance of the US-Italy relationship and the shared values between the United States and Italy. Through this series, we hope to stay connected with all of you and we look forward to a time when we will be able to do these programs again together in person and invite our American guests to visit here in person. However, today we will turn to the topic of U.S. elections. We are focusing on citizen participation in voting, which is an essential aspect of the democratic process. While the election process varies in our two countries, we share the important value that voting is a right each citizen has to voice their views of who will govern them. We are very excited to have a special guest joining us from the United States, Dr. Carolyn Jefferson Jenkins, author of a number of books, including a recently published book entitled The Untold Story of Women of Color in the League of Women Voters. She is the first African-American president of the National League of Women Voters. She headed the largest nonpartisan citizen organization in the United States, and her leadership sought to promote the League's strength as a grassroots organization, with membership through 1,100 local leagues. Dr. Jefferson Jenkins has contributed to numerous journals and books on election reform, as well as serving on numerous boards, including Howard University's Women Ambassadors Program. One last reminder before I turn it over to Dr. Jefferson Jenkins. Following her presentation, we will have a Q&A session. Please remember at any point during her presentation and during the Q&A section, you may fill in on the Facebook page or the YouTube channel, depending which platform you're watching on, your question. So please don't wait till the end of the presentation. Finally, please remember this is a nonpartisan informational session. With that, I would like to invite Dr. Jefferson Jenkins to present her next. As virtual goes, I forgot to unmute. So <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Karen, for that humbling introduction. I uh, thank you to my colleagues at the U.S. Embassy and Consulates in Italy for inviting me. I'm delighted to be able to interact with you today on a topic that is crucially important in light of current day circumstances and conversations on how the United States as a society deals with issues of social and racial injustice, election integrity, and a global pandemic. What we will do is what will define us for the next generation. So I have, I wanna share my screen with you just one second. So in preparing my remarks, I asked myself why this topic would be of interest as a part of this program series. And there are some universal themes and struggles everywhere that represent passion, a sense of purpose, and perseverance that transcend race and global boundaries. I came to the conclusion that we need to be reminded of the power that we gain 
when we truly understand the importance of active civic participation in governance. Therefore, I have chosen then, now, and next as the organizing theme for my topic on activism, civic participation, and U.S. elections, showing the connection between the past and present as it serves as a prelude for our future. This topic complements the other discussions that are a part of this ongoing series and will hopefully assist you as you formulate a comprehensive understanding of our global democratic connection and our shared values. Thank you for allowing me to share my life's passion and purpose with you. I would also like to thank the co-sponsors, Prime Minister and the University of Salento. I'm looking forward to the question and answer session that will follow my presentation because the richness of any presentation is in the discussion that follows. You are a savvy group and you read a lot, so I wanna use a different approach with you. One that will humanize history and inspire you to use your platform for activism. From the previous speakers, you've become acquainted with the operational and the legal and the technical components of a participatory democracy in the United States. But we are engaged in more than an intellectual exercise. I am going to add faces to the topic because it is the story of real people, real issues, real challenges, and real accomplishments. I will approach this from a personal perspective because it is the stories of transformational moments in history that will resonate most with you. These experiences should allow you to combine practical application with theory, lived experiences with current day realities that will help you shape your journey for the future. For most in my lifetime, I've witnessed some of the most consequential changes in society and in politics and history. And I have learned that change does not always occur with a single event or even a series of events, but with an ongoing commitment. 2020 is the year that will test our resolve as individuals and citizens of the world. It will challenge the progress that we have made and dare us to do something about it. On such issues as civil rights, and gender equality and changing roles, citizen participation, especially during a pandemic, women's participation and leadership in the political process, our changing demographics, the constitution as a living document in which each generation defines its relationship. Time does not change the importance of any of these issues. So why does any of this matter? It matters now because of the uncertainty in this world, in our institutions, and in the way we treat each other, in the way that we shape our future. It has always mattered. So let's get started. I selected specific photos because they represent universal themes that transcend time, race, global locations. They tell stories of progress and overcoming barriers. They cause us to question how we hold ourselves accountable. So if you remember nothing else, remember this. Protecting and expanding voting rights benefits all as a nation. Progress is fragile and we must be vigilant lest we lose any gains we have made. We have a responsibility to and for each other that transcends gender, race, age, country of residence. We can make a difference if we choose to. This year is a year of celebration. The photo that you see on the left is of the 1913 Women's March in Washington, D.C. that was lobbying for the passage of the 19th Amendment. And the 19th Amendment said, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. But Congress did not enforce it for women of color. 
So the 100th anniversary in 1920 was not the celebration for all women that it should have been because women of color had to wait another 45 years till the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 before they could vote as first class citizens. Did the role of these women change the conversation or were these women changed by the conversation? We only need to look at comments about women candidates and how there is a double standard that we live by. Women are subjected to not only comments about gender roles, but about their appearance and their race um, and their gender. And I'm always reminded of a comment that Corazon Aquino, who was the first female president of the Philippines made, she was president from 1986 uh, to 1992. And in 1987, Typhoon Betty hit the Philippines. And one of the things that Corazon Aquino had to consider as the first female president is before she would make her comments, would she put on makeup or not? That would not have been an issue for men. The now picture is the 2016 Women's March in Washington, the largest march, one of the largest marches for advocating for women's rights that has occurred. Juxtapose that with the 1913 parade, women showing their passion and recognizing their power. 2020 is also the 150th anniversary of the passage of the 15th Amendment that granted suffrage to black men. And the 15th Amendment read, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. The Congress shall have power to enforce the article by appropriate legislation. At its 150th anniversary, because it was passed in 1870, Congress still has not always enforced this amendment. Yet uh, in 2008, despite the obstacles that were put in place, we ended up with a person of color, the first president of color elected. And you'll notice that the power of voting was something that he too appreciated. And you'll notice in the picture on the now side that that is uh, former President Barack Obama voting. March 7th, 1965, is known as Bloody Sunday. The person you see being held to the ground is former um, Congressman John Lewis, who just recently passed away. But on March 7th, 1965, an estimated 600 civil rights marchers headed southeast 50 miles from Selma to Montgomery. The march was led by John Lewis and the Reverend Hosiah Williams. As they crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge, they were turned back. 13 people were killed and 15 wounded. The culmination of, this was the culmination of a struggle for voting rights. 15 years later, 50 years later in 2015, you'll see John Lewis again at the center of a march to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge. But what you will notice is the difference. This is a multi-racial, multi-generational, group of individuals who still recognize the power of voting. Black people wanted to participate in the political process, which is beneficial to all people. And in the political process that governs our lives, we have to make sure that we participate. And John Lewis said that there, is, there are places and moments in America where this nation's destiny is defined. Selma was one of those places. On the left, then we witnessed the swearing in of uh, former judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who again also recently passed away. She was an architect of a legal fight for women's rights in the 70s. And for many of you listening, um, don't remember that women were not allowed to even have their own credit cards during that time. She was a champion for women's rights. And as she served her 27 years, on the nation's highest court. She fought for women's rights and civil rights and human rights. 
while juggling activism and marriage and motherhood. In 1996, she was the architect of the uh, passage of the U.S. v. Virginia, which allowed women to attend the Virginia Military Institute for the first time. And then this is personal. 50 years ago, when I had my uniform of resistance as I went away to college, um, my story of activism began. It was in 1968 that was a transformational moment for me because during that time, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy, the presidential candidate, was assassinated. Uh, there was a protest at the Olympics where track and field recipients uh, made a gesture, a symbol of gesture of power for black power. And there was the Vietnam War. So my story was the story of making sure that there were changes. It was a story of first. I was the first generation to go to college. Um, and as in my introduction, you heard, I was the first black president of the League of Women Voters. I was one of the first female high school principals. I was one of the first person to graduate with a doctorate from Cleveland State University. So a generation of first continued that legacy of activism. So 50 years ago, I couldn't have imagined being here today. Um, and with my 12 inch black and white TV and I had my bell bottom pants and you can see that I had my Afro, which my mother said made me a black nationalist. And 50 years ago, I could argue that the world was very different than it is today. And then I asked myself, was it? In the years prior to my setting foot on the campus of Western College, it served as a training ground for the Freedom Riders who effort in no small part led to the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. There were social changes occurring on all fronts in civil rights, in human rights, in women's rights, animal rights, women working outside the home, and somewhere between the rights and the wrongs, there was a reality that more work still needed to be done. So when I sat where you sit today, I was in the midst of the greatest social revolution that the United States had ever witnessed until now. What were the events that influenced my life? Sputnik, a man walking on the moon, transistor radio, and a colored television. Women working outside the home in roles other than secretary, teacher, nurse, and librarian. What makes my story so important is its improbability. Against the odds, I achieved. So did hundreds of women of color from the beginning of each movement. I can still recall the white only and colored only signs in public places. I can still recall the do not sell to Negroes clause on the deed of my family's first house. I can still recall having to sit on the back of the bus. I can still recall never seeing women or blacks in my textbook or learning about them in school. Because I came of age during the civil rights era, I got the right to vote at 18 in 1971 when the 26th Amendment was passed. What we did during that time made space for others. We provided a space for a sense of agency. And on the picture on the right here, here I was 50 years later receiving the Free Freedom Summer of 64 award. 1992 was defined as the year of the woman because we had five women who were elected to the U.S. Senate. Now, in 2018, we have hundreds of women in Congress. And during this election, there will be 122 women who are on the ballot for positions in the U.S. Congress. The power of resistance and resilience and renewal, the power of passion and purpose and perseverance is shown by these women. All of this results from either legislation, activism, uh, a change in Supreme Court rulings. And I wanted to share with you the voting timeline that has made all of this progress possible, but is currently, each of these is currently being challenged as we move forward. 
So in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see President Lyndon Johnson signing the 1965 Voting Rights Act. But reminder, in 1870, the 15th Amendment was passed, and in 1920, the 19th Amendment. It was not until 1947 that legal barriers to Native American voting were removed. Not until 1952 that Asian ancestry citizenship was granted. Not until 1961 that the 23rd Amendment gave Washington, D.C. citizens a vote for president. Not until 1965 that the Voting Rights Act was passed. Not until 1971 that the 26th Amendment granted 18-year-olds the right to vote. 1975, ballots in different languages. In 1993, the National Voter Registration Act was passed, which allowed for people to register to vote when they received their driver's licenses. And in 2002, the Help America Vote Act was passed that would assist states with consistency in how they administered elections. I want to share with you the words of President Johnson as he was pleading to Congress to pass the Voting Rights Act. And he said, I speak tonight for the dignity of man and the destiny of democracy. I urge every member of both parties, Americans of all religions and colors from every section of this country to join me in this cause. This time on this issue, there must be no delay, no hesitation, and no compromise with our purpose. Those words prevented the continuation of what you see here, which was a part of my coming of age, whites only and colored only signs, recognizing that we are the United States of America. The Voting Rights Act also allowed my grandmother at 62 years old to stop having to pay poll taxes. One of the things, I, this is an, a, an artifact that I use as a motivation to keep me in the game of activism. But one of the things I noticed, and I did not notice at first, is the date of the issuance of this poll tax receipt is October 1st, 1965. If you recall, I just told you that the Voting Rights Act was passed in August of 1965. So the implementation of the act did not occur in every state as it should have occurred. And this is my life today. I pass this on the, these two symbols on a daily basis. And the juxtaposition of these two symbols indicate that the U.S. is still a nation divided. The Confederate flag and the Black Lives Matter sign. And the, it's consistent with the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, known as the Kerner Commission, which issued a report in 1968 after the riots of 1967. And it said that our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. It found that poverty and institutional racism were driving inner city violence. President Johnson constituted the commission to identify the genesis of the Violent Acts of 1967. 50 years later, a report was written that said the Kerner Commission got it right, yet we never listened to the recommendations. As we continue to look at what is going on in 2020 in terms of elections and in terms of how we deal with each other, this voter suppression map is going to be critical as we begin to look at results from elections. Once the United States Supreme Court in 2013 uh, stripped some of the provisions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, state legislators began to enact voter suppression efforts, including voter ID, uh, dual, a dual registration system, early voting uh, restrictions than the elimination of same day voting. And you can see the states that began to um, implement this. Another voter suppression map that shows where there are different states that are beginning to implement voter suppression. Um, I'm sorry, voter suppression uh, 
initiatives. And so voter suppression is still a problem in the US and people of color are still disproportionately affected. So I began with then and now, let's talk about next. The fight today has expanded to include all groups because we live in a non-conforming and non-binary society. What we recognize though, is that time does not change the importance of the issues. Women is 52% of voters, yet their power is only being fully realized now. There are still struggles of gender and race and ideology. There is still gerrymandering and still conversations about election integrity. So the US election of 2020, what is at stake? There are 237.7 million registered voters, yet only 138 million voted in 2016, and that was 58.1%. And the expectation is that 2020 will see a sharp increase in voter participation based on early voting numbers and based on registration increase increases. In every election since 1984, women have voted in slightly higher numbers than men. So the questions we must ask ourselves is how do we ensure that women's participation and leadership in the political process continues to increase? We need to ask ourselves, why are we still having issues today? Is it because of changing demographics or consti the constitution is a living document? What will happen as a result of the census? This is a decennial census year, and the census determines the, the number of representatives that we have. How will we ensure that it, civic participation continues to be increasing on a regular basis? And what role will the US Supreme Court play in deciding issues related to election integrity? This will be the 59th United States presidential election and it will be held on November 3rd, first Tuesday after the first Monday. However, early voting has already begun in several states. This may be recorded in history as one of the most consequential. So what does any of that have to do with activism and civic participation? Grassroots protests have always been a part of our history and have resurfaced again as a part of our presence. People want their voices heard, and they are using multiple venues to have their voices heard. Social media has served to increase the visibility of those voices. What is it that makes activism so important? It's because people are passionate about issues and they want change, and that will continue. Civic participation occurs at all levels, from simply informing yourself about issues and candidates, voting, attending meetings, holding elected officials accountable, and running for office yourself. And that is one of the things that, that women are sometimes hesitant to do. Election integrity is a huge issue um, for this election, but there are very few um, indications that it should be. So, so we're just going to be vigilant with that one. As I mentioned before, the census is going to be huge and the census has been lost in the conversation of everything else that's going on. And so it's important uh, for the census to have an elevated place in the conversation because it's going to determine how we move forward for the next 10 years. Civil rights and social and racial injustice are at the forefront again primarily because they never went away. We've never really dealt with how we have a level playing field in this country. And so until we have candid conversations and have, make affirmative plans to move forward, those issues will always be around. Gender equality is still an issue in the United States and there is still an effort afoot to pass the Equal Rights Amendment, which uh, needed 38 states to be ratified and at one point thought they had 38 states, but that's still being challenged because some of the states that originally uh, signed onto the Equal Rights Amendment have uh, reneged. Healthcare in this age of pandemic is critical and the conversation about healthcare 
is one that will continue to um, elevate in the activism world. And then the Supreme Court, what kinds of decisions will the Supreme Court make that will change the trajectory of any of the legislation? And we cannot forget the global pandemic that we all are dealing with now. So we've talked about then and now and the importance of legacy, but what's next? The next generation, and that is you, is on call. What is next to do? My experiences in the era of civil rights shaped my life. They were my transformational moments. What will shape yours? Do you have to decide why you need to be active and participate? Or are you only gonna look to the past? What happened in the 1920s when the 19th Amendment was passed? What happened in the 1970s with all of the social changes that took place? What's happening in 2020 with people's voices being heard? There's always been change through grassroots movements and through the role of protest. There has always been change through legislation. What is new to these conversations is the importance of the impact of social media. So when we were struggling in the civil rights movement, television was our ally in that it brought into people's homes what was actually happening. For this generation, social media can mobilize people within seconds to do the things that it took months for us to do. Why is civil rights still important today? It's a question we need to ask ourselves. How do we make change? How do we get involved? How do we deal with the voter suppression efforts that are being resurfaced? Different experiences of different countries, but a recognition of the power of participation. There are 12 days until November 3rd, and this voter turnout will be historic. Question is, is democracy in crisis? Or are these just growing pains? There is energy in a moment, but a moment is larger, longer than an hour or a day. Changing a moment into a movement is what activism is about. You have to have a goal. You have to have a plan. You have to change protest into policy. Did the role of women 100 years ago changed the conversation, or were women changed by that conversation? We keep saying 2020 will be historic. What makes it so? These issues are not new. How does any of this impact the 2020 election? We can debate what should be next, but is there a right order of prioritization? How do we get involved? John Lewis knew the importance of activism, and he knew that it was the people who would determine it. The United States and Italy are in different places on the journey with democracy, but we both must understand the sacrifices that were made to get us there. We cannot take them for granted. We have to protect and expand voting rights. Let me have you reflect for a moment and fill in the rest of these sentences. Imagine a time when, imagine a country where, imagine a nation where citizens have access to government and know how to participate effectively in that government to make wise decisions for their communities and their country. Imagine new voters and young people who know what is expected of them as citizens and what they should expect from their leaders. Imagine a nation where all citizens have the opportunity to practice the skills of a democratic society for their families, neighbors, and national community for the common good. Imagine equality and access for all. Imagine, you complete that sentence. Imagine you can see beyond today. Imagine. Thank you for the opportunity to start this conversation about this important topic. 
And I want to close with a quote uh, from Congressman John Lewis as it relates to activism. And he said, I appeal to all of you to get into this great revolution that is sweeping this nation. Get in and stay in the streets of every city, every village and hamlet of this nation until true freedom comes, until the revolution of 1776 is complete. The way we carry on that legacy is by voting. So thank you, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you for that very outstanding presentation with offering a lot of thoughts um, for us to consider. Um, we have a number of questions already um, here, and thank you everyone for contributing. Please continue to put them forward. First, I would like to put um, a question. The Prime Minister group, who we mentioned at the beginning, is actually a group of young women who um, are learning and working together, and they pose the question of how they can raise awareness to social and civil activism. And I suppose this could be related to promoting the women's things or maybe how to fight prejudice. Thank you for that question. And there, there, it is a complex question. It can go any number of ways. A couple of things I wanna say uh, to young women as they are trying to get started. Oftentimes we look at people who give presentations or who are in the spotlight and think that we can't do that because we can't be them. And we can't. But where we can start is in conversations with our friends, conversations with our families, starting at the local level, making sure that we are aware of issues that impact us on a daily basis, getting groups of people together to mobilize, sitting in and listening to what elected officials are saying, attending council meetings, attending um, meetings where elected officials are having conversations and holding them accountable. It starts small and it can mushroom. Um, the other thing is to stay connected, not only to like-minded people, but to people who may disagree with what you say. It is important to also know what they are saying. So we need to start small and work our way up. We also need to begin to see ourselves running for office. And oftentimes uh, women feel that they have to be overprepared in order to run into office, to run for office, but men don't, they just go out there and do it. And so women need to have confidence in themselves, make a plan, surround yourself with people who will support you, align yourself with people whose issues can support where you want to go. There is power in numbers. There is power in voting. There is power in having the conversations and being visible. So the biggest thing I would say, be visible and hold people accountable, including yourself. Thank you for that. Sort of related to that, um, last point on supporting women and finding those people around you to support them. How are ways that men can play a positive role, whether it's supporting um, you know, people in their lives, their family members, their spouses, maybe to political office or to other aspects of activism? Hey, thank you again for that question. And I did not mean to um, discount men because they are crucial in this role. Some of my best mentors were men because men are in those conversations already. And so one of the things that, that men need to do is start looking around the table and if they see no women, or if they see only one woman, they need to ask why. And they need to bring women into that conversation and mentor them from the perspective of um, how that organization works. And so men as mentors, men as supporters, men as initiators of women being in that conversation. And if women are not there, having men understand that their voice is equally important and they need to speak up on behalf of women because some of the biggest supporters we have are the men in our lives. And it, it, it's important to do that. Um, there are, there have been times when, um, well, I just did a presentation um, at a VA facility 
And there was a group of men and they, well, what can we do? And I said, well, look in this room, all you see are men. Did, it, did any of you ever question why there are no women here? And it just never even occurred to them that they should question that. And so we have just got to make sure that we keep saying, are there women there? And train them to do the same. And there are uh, any number of men who are supportive of women's issues. Otherwise, we would not have made much of the progress that we have made. Um, shifting to another group of voters that um, has been of interest, not only, of course, in the United States, but we also saw it here in Italy um, that experienced elections recently, um, is the younger generation. You know, you're talking about calling to that next generation, but what about the youngest group of voters? We had a question from um, Marta Lauro, who was asking um, about raising awareness among young students, university students, people who are, you know, of the age who are probably voting for the first time and um, sort of linked to their particip participation and activism is probably social media. So I guess, what are your thoughts on them as a voting block, but also the link to social media and how does that increase their activism or decrease it? Okay, I, I am encouraged by the amount of energy that is being devoted to this younger generation currently. Um, I am uh, interested, what's interesting to me is oftentimes people in the younger generation will say to elected officials, what are you gonna do for me? And my question back to them is, what are you gonna do for yourself? You, you have a voice. You have more of a voice than we had previously because you have social media. And it's important to use social media to get the message out. Every issue that is being currently discussed impacts your life. And so while it may be uncomfortable for me to be on TikTok, it's not uncomfortable for you to be on TikTok. And so what is the issue that you want people to be engaged in? Use your social media to do that. Uh, the number of followers that some people have is astounding to me. Activism is about initially having that conversation, informing yourself about what you are passionate about. And each of us is passionate about something. When I was your age, I was passionate about 18 year olds getting the right to vote because my friends were going off to fight in the war in Vietnam at 18 and we couldn't vote until we were 21. That was my passion. And I found people who were also passionate about it. And then we determined, how do we make that move forward? We have to talk to our legislators. We have to talk to support groups. We have to talk to anybody who will listen to show them the importance of what it is we're saying. And so my, my advice is don't get discouraged if you think you're not being heard, because you are being heard. You just have to be persistent. And you have to know that change does not necessarily occur overnight. So find your passion, find a path to make that voice heard, and know that it may take a little bit of time, that it's not going to occur instantly, and that you can't give up. Um, and as you saw in my photo, 50 years ago, I was that activist. And 50 years later, I'm still that activist, because it takes time to get things passed. And so. I know that a lot of younger people want immediacy. And if it doesn't happen immediately, the attention span is not there. But you have so many tools available to you that we did not have. Find your passion, find a path, and turn that passion into policy that will impact everyone. So shifting a little bit, to a more process-related question when it comes to elections in the United States in particular. Julia, Julia Spezzano has asked, why don't people vote on Sunday in the United States? Because that could encourage, to, or I guess that's really the question is, why, why do we not vote on Sunday in the United States? Okay, Julia, that's a, a good question. And the answer is complex because there is 
no national voting um, block. Every state and every um, every state has its own method of voting and ways of voting. There are some states that do allow voting on Sunday. It is not a national trend, but each state determines the the method of voting that they feel will best suit the the residents of that state. And that's one of the things that's also in question right now is how states are adjusting their usual practices to um, disenfranchise some groups of people. It is a good idea. It is an idea that has been bandied about for years. I don't know that all 50 states will ever decide on the same methods of voting. Uh, but there has also been conversation about making voting a national holiday. And that way, everybody gets to just take that national holiday and vote. But that also has been a conversation for many years. So as we look to trying to enfranchise and have as many people as possible participate, we need to look at all the alternatives. And Sunday voting is not off the table. Thank you. Another question related to the voting process that certainly has come up a lot more this year, and you mentioned the early voting that has already started in a number of states in the United States. But we have also seen, and both Julia and uh, members of the prime minister group raised the question about the electronic voting or absentee voting and the skepticisms and the debates that we're seeing around that. And what are your thoughts on that? Okay, that, that is, uh, again, a good question. And you have to separate the politics from the practicality of it. Um, I currently live in North Carolina, but previously I lived in Colorado, which was all mail-in. So everybody who was registered got their ballot in the mail and there was never a question about the integrity of that process. And, and it was what we were accustomed to. When I moved to North Carolina, um, that was not the case. And so I will be voting in person on November 3rd, but there are um, absentee ballot processes that are in place. And one of the interesting things about North Carolina is the absentee ballot requires a witness signature, which uh, people are, uh, many people are opposed to because if you don't have a witness, then your, your ballot doesn't count. Um, so the, the conversation, if we move it from the political to the practical, there are systems in place to maintain the integrity of the process. One of the, the criticisms of what is going on in this 2020 election is that the, the sheer volume of mail-in ballots and absentee ballots will overwhelm the postal system. And so many states have had to make adjustments and have drop-off boxes. And there, there are solutions to every perceived problem. And the secretaries of state are dealing with those solutions. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to seeing how this plays out because it will allow us to, um, it will allow us to, to see where there are stress points and weaknesses in the current systems and to, to make some improvements. And if I, if I didn't answer the question, would you ask me, ask the question again, uh, please? Here. Yeah, no, I believe that answered the question. Um, feel free everyone to chat um, or to send in another point if that did not answer the question. Um, Another question um, that we have is um, returning more to um, the upcoming election. And I don't know if you have a crystal ball or anything, but a number of people are interested because you touched upon the voter turnout. And um, maybe what, is, what do we anticipate this year given that early voting has already started? what does this mean um, or um, what are your thoughts about voter turnout in the upcoming election? 
I'm encouraged that turnout will increase because previously, um, as you know, it's usually only been around 50 to 58 percent. Based on the numbers that are coming in for early voting and mail-in voting, we should exceed that. And that is encouraging to me because in a democratic process, if people don't participate, then we are not getting a full view of what the common good is. So I, I'm optimistic. You're right. I don't have a crystal ball, but based on the trends, the current trends, there should be an increase in the percentage of people who are participating in all age ranges. And I'm particularly uh, interested to see what the younger group, the 18 to 30 group, um, does in terms of participation. So um, another uh, question um, that we have is with regards, um, getting, I think, back to the activism aspect is, um, have you seen a resurgence in grassroots efforts in the US, in the United States in the past few years? And who do you think is driving it? Is it a generational thing or are there certain groups that are doing that and how could either Americans or Italians um, find organizations to get involved? There has been absolutely an increase in grassroots activism, and we only need to look at, uh, I showed you the photo of the 2016 Women's March. That has occurred every year since then. Uh, we look at the protest marches that are um, addressing the issues of social and racial injustice. This is the first time, I liken this back to the 1960s, this is the first time since 1968 that I've seen this kind of mobilization on issues. And like I said, a lot of it is because um, social media has allowed people to mobilize. The main issue is how do you keep that momentum going? If activism often is associated with groups but oftentimes it's just grassroots people getting together. So in terms of finding groups in every country, whether it be the United States, uh, Italy, or, or any other country, there are lists of groups that have social consciousness issues, racial justice issues, women's issues, gender -based, other gender-based issues. Um, there are many nonprofits and non-governmental organizations that address issues on a daily basis. And so if you need to connect with a group, I would simply say, and I don't want to say Google, <laughs> I, I would simply say research on the internet and, and just type in what it is you're looking for and you will come up with a list. The other thing that you need to do is as you talk to people, find out who they're connected with. People often ask me what groups I belong to. And if I am looking to be sure um, that I want to expand the reach of what I'm doing, I always invite people in as well. And so it, it's that connection, it's the networking, it's the researching to find out which groups actually are um, doing the kind of work that you want to do. Um, and it's sometimes you starting that group. Many people have leadership skills in pulling people together that they're not even aware of. And so there is nothing wrong with you starting a group of people that you want to uh, pull together. That is what happened with uh, the Me Too movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, many of the movements that you see now that have garnered participation from thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. Thank you for that question. Um, we had, a, at the end of the presentation, you talked about looking ahead and a number of the different, um, I guess, themes that are have been a part of not only this election cycle, but have been present in a number of election cycles. And we have a question from Luigi Destradas, who says, good morning, and he has a question about the um, current administration underestimating certain aspects of the global pandemic that we're all facing worldwide. And will this impact or impact the elections and voter participation?
Thank you, Luigi. Um, that is uh, an excellent question, and I'm only going to deal with one part of that question because I'm nonpartisan. Um, voter participation during the pandemic has been a challenge. And the decision that is before most people is, how do I vote without endangering my health? And so for many people, uh, that's why we've seen an increase in the request for absentee ballots. That's why we have seen an increase in the number of mail-in ballots. And that's why we've seen an increase in the number of people participating in early voting. We have had to make some adjustments as um, all countries have had to make during this pandemic and make sure that we are allowing access points for every person who wants to vote. There are reports, however, and, and I see them on the news daily, of long lines and people standing in lines for hours. That is more a function of um, the allocation of resources within individual states. And that allocation of resources is the responsibility in most states of the Secretary of State, and people need to hold that person accountable. But it is critical that people take care of themselves as they are voting and take care of the people who are there to assist them in voting. And that requires a sense of responsibility uh, that I see a lot of people taking. And so how we are dealing with elections during the pandemic is it, in many instances being proactive and recognizing that we have had to make some adjustments. Um, and a lot of the, the conversation that we hear is not the practical impl implementation that is going on. And the practical implementation that is going on is a little more positive than what you, you may be hearing. But people are making the choice to vote. And in this critical year, it, I am impressed by that. And they're making the choice to vote responsibly, and they're making the choice to vote in a, in a manner in which they are safe. And so as long as we continue to do that, um, I think that the impact on the election actually is going to be an increase in the number of voters who are out there because this is something that is important to people. Yes, I think it's really important that we all remember back to that um, concrete point that all of these things and movements have given us that voice and it's important for us to utilize that voice. Um, moving into a slightly more personal topic for you, a couple of the Prime Minister women's groups are interested if they could study in the United States at some point um, for their graduate work or university work that are there any um, particular programs in gender policy, leadership, administration related to activism that you are aware of and that you would recommend? There are so many good programs nationally. Um, so the answer to the second part that I would recommend offhand, I can't think of any, but, but there, because I can't think of any because there are so many. Every university, um, including the one that I'm affiliated with, has encouraged student activism and through their, not only through the courses, but through the Department of Women's Studies, through the Department of Gender, um, Non-Binary Gender Studies, through the Department um, of Politics. There are all kinds of clubs and, and, and groups that promote activism. Um, and the conversations that are had in the courses promote that sense of wanting to be a part of this governance structure. And so I, you know, depending on what state you're in, I, whatever state I'm in, I enjoy and I enjoy those universities. And so there are so many, I think, again, I, I, if you did internet research on what you're passionate about, I would not be opposed to sharing my opinion. <laughs> with my contact information with you later, but I don't, I don't have any recommendations right now, but I think we can stay connected. And if you 
um, offline want to, to shoot me some recommendations that you have been considering, I certainly will give you my opinion on that. Thank you so much, Dr. Jefferson Jenkins. And I guess I just want to remind those in our audience, in mid-November, we will have a program discussing international education. And we do, through um, both the embassy and all the consulates, offer free Education USA advising. So um, if anybody is interested in that, please reach out to your respective embassy or consulate, and we can certainly connect you with um, an advisor who, again, those services are all for free. Um, uh, let's see. So I think another one also coming from a group um, of the university students, they are interested in um, who are some of the important um, female figures or possibly male that you um, admire um, or who have driven you? You know, you talk a lot about this passion and how you found your passion. And were there certain people that you modeled yourself on as you, um, you know, went forth in your activism over the years? That, that's a great question. And uh, I neglected to say that actually my sense of passion and activism is rooted in uh, the activities of my grandmother. And I, my grandmother uh, was born in 1903. So um, by 1920, uh, she became a teacher um, at a normal school because schools were segregated. And so she would pick cotton in the morning and she would teach school midday. And in the evening, she would teach people to write so that they could register to vote. And that's where my sense of activism came from. Um, and I showed you her poll tax receipts. So for the, until she was 62 years old, she could not vote without restrictions. And something was wrong with that. Um, and I saw how hard she worked to make sure that people could vote. And so voting became my passion, getting people connected and, and making sure that they voted and making sure that there were policies that were not discriminatory became my passion. And I saw her begin from the smallest point. She wasn't a legislator. She didn't run for office. She just worked with the people within her sphere of influence to help them do better. And some of them went on to be legislators. And the award that I, I received 50 years later, I accepted on behalf of her. Other people that have been influential, I am a huge fan of uh, Barbara Jordan. And one of the things that she said uh, in a speech at uh, commencement at Harvard University in 1977, she said, what the people want is simple. They want an America as good as its promise. She was the first congresswoman from the South, first black congresswoman from the South. And I am a huge fan of her activism and her, and her journey to get to be that first congresswoman. I also, um, Geraldine Ferraro, I, I'm a fan of her as the first woman vice presidential candidate. And so there are any number of women uh, who have been um, stars, I call them stars in history, that, that I am fans of. Uh, Barbara Jordan is one of them, um, Geraldine Ferraro. But the, the most important one, again, is my grandmother. And so my, my advice to you is don't look beyond your immediate circle for heroes because they're right there in front of you. They're working every day and they're doing things every day to make this world a better place. And oftentimes they don't get the recognition that they deserve. Um, and I can't forget John Lewis, you saw, I, I'm a huge fan of John Lewis um, and because he started in his 20s with his activism and you saw him crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge and he received a concussion. I mean, he was beaten, but he continued until he became a congressman and continued his work from that point on. So there are any number of heroes um, and I had the opportunity in writing my book to look at some of those heroes and in the hundred years uh, since the passage of the 19th Amendment, women of color were not given their due and they were there um, from the beginning making uh, 
contribute significant contributions, but they were never recognized either. And so I, I, I just, we just need to ask ourselves, who are we considering the people who are most influential in our lives? Start with the people who surround us and then look at other people. And I am always impressed by any woman who has to struggle to be the first or the only, because there is a certain struggle that's associated with that, uh, that other people can't appreciate. And so we just have to keep moving forward. Okay, I know we've reached our hour, but if we could maybe do a couple more questions before we conclude. Sure. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so there, of course, you know, as your presentation offered, um, you know, a look back, a look at the present and a look to the future. Um, and certainly for the United States, that's often um, involved, um, you know, the fight for civil rights and particularly for African-American civil rights. And of course, with our recent African-American president, and sort of what are your thoughts about some of the events that are happening now and um, maybe looking to the future? Um, I think every democracy tends to have steps forward and steps back. That is sort of the nature of a democracy. And a couple of thoughts you might have on that. And that is a, a good question. And that's one of the, the points that I was, was trying to make is that, um, just because we've made progress or think we've made progress in the past doesn't mean that that progress stays if we're not vigilant. Um, the events that are, are going on now are necessary. And they're necessary because, and I can't remember who made this quote, but every generation um, defines its own relationship with the Constitution and the democratic process. And so oftentimes, we get to a point where we think we've made progress and then we become complacent. And I, I often say with 2020, we were on autopilot for a while. People weren't participating in voting. Voting participation was low. People weren't really engaged in um, social or, or racial justice issues until they had to be. And now we are facing what I call a stress test. We've identified some flaws in our constitution. We have realized that while we may have thought racial and social justice issues were no longer um, at the forefront of our conversation, they are. The events that, that are going on now are forcing us to decide how we wanna proceed in the future. If what we have is okay, and then we as a people, we the people decide that, that what we have is okay, then it will be. We haven't decided that. You can see from women's marches, you can see from the protest about social and racial injustice, you can see by the increase in the number of people who are voting and participating that the events now will help shape us for the next 10 years. We have a stress test on our constitution, we adjust and we move forward. I always juxtapose 1968 with 2020 because 1968 was the transformational year for me. Everything that is going on in 2020 is the same for me as it was in 1968. So I'm anticipating that another 40 years from now, we will see the same kind of activity using different formats and different platforms, but the same kind of activity because every time we get to a point where we think everything is okay, there are, there are new groups of people and new issues that show us that we really haven't dealt with the issues from the past like we should have. And that we are going to have to do that in order to sit back and be comfortable. I would argue, however, that we never really need to be that comfortable, that we always need to be moving forward and including people and making life better for everyone. And when, when I talked about imagine, imagine a time where we would have everyone with equal access and economic empowerment and political empowerment. That would be a time where we could sit back and rest on our laurels. 
that time has not come in the past 100 years, and it may not come in the next 100 years. And that's why activism is so important, because it is the voices of the people who want to make things better that have to be heard. And there are a number of people who cannot have their voice heard. So those of us who have the opportunity to provide voice for them must do so. So related to that, a question came in um, that is asking with regards to the activism and the things we've discussed today, do you see more powerful the silent revolutions we saw in the 50s and 60s versus some that we're seeing today in 2020 that some may argue are in a different uh, vein from the activities that happened in the 60s? Could you repeat the first part of that question again for me, please? It's related to uh, which is more powerful, some of the silent movement type of activities um, related to the civic activism in the 50s and 60s. Um, uh, I'm thinking that they are reflecting on um, the sit-ins and things like that versus some of the other activities that have happened and occurred this year in 2020 related to the Black Lives Matter movement. Is one type of activism more powerful than another? That is an interesting question. And I would say that I don't have a, uh, an answer that I would be able to stick with for any length of time. Um, what makes activism powerful is the impact that it has in turning that activism into some policy that makes a greater change. Um, it goes, it, it, it's interesting because in the 60s, there was that same conversation about the civil rights movement, whether it was to be nonviolent as one faction wanted, was it to continue to be nonviolent or was it to be violent? I mean, so there, there's always that tension between how much pressure do we apply and how do we apply that pressure to get to the point where we need to get to. So sit-ins had their place. Actually, sit-ins were revolutionary for that time. Um, were they any more effective than riots? It depends on who you ask. Um, are pro silent protests now, the marches, any more effective than riots? I don't know. My preference is to turn protest into policy, to have um, voices heard and listen to, um, to gain visibility in the, in the ways that we can gain visibility without destruction and without harm to people. That is my preference. But there are others who will, will disagree with that. And that has always been a tension in activism. My choice of activism is more on the quiet side. Um, and making sure that I get information out, making sure that I educate people, making sure that I tell people how to connect, that's where I'm comfortable. I am not a, um, at this stage of the game, I'm not a marcher, but I have been at one point. Uh, so, it, uh, you know, I'll, it, it depends on, on what the goal is. And my goal is always to get some policy that makes a change for everybody long term. And I do that in more of a quiet way. Thank you. Um, one last question. Um, and this question uh, comes to us from Mara Chirichu. And is there a difference between activism and volunteering? <laughs> um, there could be. Um, there, I, I look at a Venn diagram. So there's, act, there's volunteering, there's activism, and then there's something in the middle that's both. Uh, people can volunteer to register people to vote. 
people can volunteer to babysit for people who want to be poll workers. That is a form of activism. And on the continuum of activism, it's on the lower end of activism, but it is activism. Volunteering is important. Volunteering is where the education and the information is given. Volunteering is where the support is given and the conversations are had. Um, on the other end of the continuum of activism is people who are actually marching. And somewhere in between is where most people are. And so if your activism resides in being a volunteer, then that's your activism. If your activism resides in being out marching, then that's your activism. There's no right or wrong. Activism is a continuum. And you need to decide where you want to place your efforts and don't have somebody else tell you or identify for you or label for you what activism is. And on that note, I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time here. However, I want to thank you, um, Dr. Carolyn Jefferson Jenkins, for your time today. It's been a very lively discussion, um, both on and offline. And we, you certainly have given us a lot to think about in um, the coming weeks as the US election process unfolds. And to our audience out there, I want to thank all of you for tuning in and participating today. I want to give a heads up that next week, I would like all of you to join us on October 29th. Next week's program will begin at 3 p.m. Uh, Rome time, along with Marjorie Spruill, who is an author and professor emeritus at, of history at the University of South Carolina. She will be discussing the progression of the women's movement from suffragists to the 1970s protests and how to inspire us to take action in our own communities toward true gender equality. And then the following week, which will be following the US elections on November 5th, again at 3 p.m., we will be returning to the US elections. There will be a panel of Italian and American experts that will be discussing the election process and how we get from election day on November 3rd to inauguration day in mid-January. The program on November 5th will be conducted in Italian and we'll have a special guest, Professor Francesco Clemente will be emceeing. So we look forward to all of you joining us in the company weeks. And again, we wanna give a huge thank you to Dr. Jefferson Jenkins for all of her time and her insights. And hopefully she's inspired many of you to um, find your passion and uh, take up activism and ensuring that all have the right to vote and participate with that right. Thank you. Grazie a tutti.